This whole matter of self-discipline starts when I realize who owns me. I am not my own. I have been bought. I have been purchased. And you will begin to seek a holy life when you begin to understand the price that Jesus Christ paid for you. John MacArthur will show you how those glorious truths relate to what he calls the art of self-discipline. And that's the title of John's current study. Here he is with today's lesson. If you desire to be a self-disciplined person, a spiritually disciplined person, there are some very important attitudes that you must maintain. One is to remember who owns you. That is to say, you're not really in charge of your life. All that you are and all that you do, the direction of your life must come into submission to the purposes of God, which are unfolded in the Word of God and by the leading of the Spirit of God. Secondly, self-discipline comes when you look back to the covenant of your salvation, when you look back to the covenant of your salvation. That is to say, when you remember that at the point of your salvation you made a promise to submit to the Lord. And as a believer, you should mark it out that God will keep His promise to you to chasten you if you are not obedient to Him. Thirdly, it's a very, very important matter for us to recognize that sin is primarily a violation of our relationship to God. It is a violation of the intimacy which we share with a loving Lord and a gracious Savior. Now I want to take you to a fourth principle in this matter of of self-control, spiritual self-discipline that is very, very important. If you're going to be self-disciplined, you have to learn to control your imagination. You have to learn to control your imagination. Beloved, that's where the battle is fought. When you are fighting sin on the inside in your imagination, your conscience is battling alone. No one outside knows it. No one outside. And you need to be aware that the battle has to be won there. You win the battle there, and you'll win the battle on the outside. You lose the battle there, and you'll lose the battle on the outside. When somebody falls into iniquity, falls into sin, that's the product of a fantasizing imagination that has conceived of sin and consequently brought it forth. Win the battle inside. The issue is you. The issue is not the world you live in. It's you. I suppose it would be probably true that the world in which Paul lived was at least the equal of our world today in its debauchery. And I'll go beyond that. Let me tell you something. I don't know that I could ever conceive of a more debauched culture than that which surrounded the nation Israel and which encroached itself upon them until even the Jews began to commit the same kind of debauchery as the nations around them, prostitution, greed, murder child sacrifice, I mean just horrendous kind of behavior out into the Gentile world where Paul was, it was debased and debauched to the, to the degree that we know today. The only difference is that we can put it on forms of media that ancient, the ancient world didn't have. So the battle has always been fought at the same point. There, there have always been the external influences. You can't run and hide from that. That's not the problem. The problem is the internal lust that is generated in an imagination that is not subject to the truth. Self-discipline, then, begins with, with our theology, knowing who owns us, knowing the price that was paid for us, remembering the covenant we made with the Lord when we came to Him, the recognition of all sin as a violation of our relationship. And then it moves out of our theology into our own personal spirituality And self-discipline becomes a matter of controlling your imagination. And if you are to do that, you must hide the Word of God in your heart so that it comes ringing loud and clear and activates your conscience. Conscience is not in itself a moral law. It is merely a device that reacts to moral law. You could, you could describe it as a skylight. It is not in itself a light. 
It is merely a skylight that lets the outside light in. The outside light is the truth of God. The conscience is the skylight that lets it in. And you remember Paul said, keep that clean so the light comes in. And you definitely want that. Now we live in a culture which assaults that two ways. First of all, our society wants to change the moral code. So let's take the Bible and get rid of it. Let's just get rid of it. We don't want this for our moral law, so we'll invent a new one. We'll let MTV invent it. We'll come up with a brand new morality. We'll let, um, we'll let the sexual revolution invent it and the, the gay and lesbian groups. We'll, we'll have them invent a new moral code. Now what? Now conscience has a problem because conscience is not a moral law. Conscience is merely a device that reacts to what you believe. Muslims have conscience. Buddhists have conscience. They don't know the truth of God, but there's, the conscience is a human mechanism that reacts to your belief system. So what happens in our society is you invent an erroneous, deceptive, lying, hellish, damning moral system. And now what you've got is misinformation going to the conscience. So the radar doesn't work. It's non-functioning. In addition to that, we have the psychology world. And what is the goal of modern psychology? The goal of modern psychology is to train people to ignore their conscience. Your conscience is making you feel guilty? That's wrong. You're not a bad person. You're what? You're good. You lack self-esteem. In fact, you're so much better than you think you are that it's really troublesome. And most of your problems are because you don't know how good you really are. So when conscience says you're guilty, you're guilty, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, you silence that conscience. So on the one hand, the culture develops a completely new moral system, and on the other hand, it trains people to ignore their conscience. So you have a whole civilization of people flying stone blind and crashing and burning all over the place. Here we are in the midst of this as Christians who have the Word of God, who know the Word of God, with a fully informed conscience. And a conscience that is told what is right, and we are also told to listen to that conscience. And when the conscience says, pull up, don't do this, stop, do what's right, that is a God-given gift. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's paralleled on the physical side in, in human beings by pain. You might not think pain is a good thing, but it is. Pain is a good thing because pain tells you your body has a problem. If you don't feel any pain, you would eventually just die because you wouldn't remedy your condition. When pain comes, it's God's way of saying, stop doing that, you're hurting your body. And when conscience starts yelling at you, it's God's gift to you saying, stop that, you're hurting your soul. And it's at the level of conscience that you have to do the battle of controlling your imagination. So keep your conscience highly informed. You know, that's one of the wonderful benefits of being in a, in a, in a church and having been taught and trained the Word of God. It's wonderful for those of you who know the Word of God and know it soundly and solidly. Why? Because your conscience is fully informed. And it's very important that you not believe the psychological lies today of those who want to dispossess you of any guilt and, and make you feel uh, completely exonerated from any guilt of any kind. That is a very, very devastating way to silence a God-given warning system in the souls of men and women. And it's a very effective campaign, believe me. But here we are as Christians with a fully informed conscience, a fully sensitized conscience, and we know enough to listen when it speaks. Listen to your conscience. It's built upon the Word of God, and that's how you control your imagination.